it's a real privilege being a developer of just, just one building. You know, it's probably going to last in that place for, for quite a, a long time, sometimes you know, hun hundreds of years. And that, um, that formation of you know, art and design uh, on show to everyone you know, is probably the most physical, permanent ex expression of, of any kind of art. And I know lots of you might not think that you know, many buildings have had any art or design involvement in, in them at all, but uh, they all have. In some in some way, and that um, and that physical presence uh, should be very rewarding for everyone involved in it. If you're doing a development where you are doing dozens of new buildings and you're creating new streets and new public spaces, uh, it obviously is a huge privilege, but it also takes on a bit of a responsibility, not just for the developer, but all of the people that guide and control you from a from a policy point of view. Uh, and have a creative dialogue with you to end up with a whole new piece of Birmingham or a piece of Manchester or a piece of London, a new piece of King's Cross, which you know, obviously is, is well on, on the way, but uh, quite, a, quite a few more years left to develop up, up there. Um, this kind of privilege and the role of the guiding and controlling organisations um, and in the case of, of any development, it starts with the, with the national government and its policies. Um, and in some ways, uh, we do uh, guide the national statements and planning statements. I know not many of us ever get involved in the, in the national policy documents, but we all vote at general elections and those policies um, are made at the national level. And then they come down to the regional level. Uh, and I'm sure some of you are very aware of the, of the Mayor and the London Plan, and maybe some of you have been involved in those. And then they come down to the local level. They're all meant to be guided from the top and then from the region and coming down. Uh, and obviously, in our case here, we've got Southwark and their policies for the borough and particularly for Canada Water. And they've all gone through a process. It's a democratic process. It might not be ideal. You know, you've all been able to have a say at various levels uh, going through. Um, I suspect if I asked you where your favourite urban places were in the UK, you'd probably think of some parts of, of London. Uh, you might think of cities like, like Bath or, or Market Town. But most of the people I ask that when they list, they're all quite old. Uh, and they're certainly before 1947 and the Planning Act. So you could jump to the conclusion that, um, that the Planning Act and the way we now plan developments you know, is doing something wrong. And I'm not suggesting that at all because there were lots of very bad developments before the Planning Act. And in fact, the Planning Act came in um, to provide a greater element of political control, control, public scrutiny and democratic involvement. So you might not feel that you have much say about big developments or any developments, but it's a damn sight better than it was before that Planning Act came in. Now many of you probably feel you never have a proper debate and scrutiny, you've got your lives to lead, and you know, getting involved in all that multi-level planning uh, from the government right the way down you know, is hard work, but some people do uh, stay involved and help and guide us through all of that. Um, I've been lucky enough in over 30 years to have been involved in, in some of the big cities and obviously London. And these developments, we have always managed to have built a good, strong consensus before we started. It's never 100%. Uh, I think you know, the day you have 100% consensus on anything uh, such as changing the physical nature on, on such a scale, you should probably, probably get worried. But a strong, a strong consent is absolutely uh, consensus is absolutely essential to the long-term success. And I think part of that is being open and honest uh, and saying what is possible and what is not possible as well. Uh, and I hope I have been able to do that over my career uh, and I'm always accessible. So I would say yes to this as I did. I would go anywhere, any place, any time that my diary lets me to, to listen and, and have a debate. And looking at other countries uh, and you know, 
having been involved in our planning system, I actually think our planning system is okay. Uh, it needs better resourcing, uh, and uh, it's got some great, great people in it, uh, but it can work. It can work if, uh, if people um, uh, engage in it uh, and, and support it. Um, over the past few years, I don't need to, to tell you that we appear to be in an ever increasingly divided society. And uh, has development become easier uh, or harder? I guess uh, you, would, you would assume it, it's become harder, and you're right. Uh, but so have a lot of other things in, uh, in politics where you require consensus, the us, us and them society, the, the left versus right, the public versus the private sector, the leave for the UK and uh, leave the EU and stay in the EU, young versus old. So have things got particularly worse uh, since the invention of Twitter and things like that? Um, Muhammad Ali spoke at the Oxford Union in the, in the early 70s, and uh, he read them a poem, and I'll read it, read it to you now. He just said, me, we. Now, in the early, early 70s, As my son pointed out quite recently to me, uh, he came home from school, my son, and he said, Do you know, Dad, in 1969, there was racial segregation in the United States of America. He said, you know, you were my age, and there was still... How, how could that be? Um, you know, that's divided society. You know, a lot of things have changed. Equal rights for gay men were only uh, established in Scotland in 2014. Uh, Women got the vote 100 years ago, but only if you were over 30. And in fact, it was 1928 when all women got the old vote. So there's always been you know, huge divides in society. And as soon as we resolve those problems, we kind of move on and go on to the next divide. I'm not saying that any of the issues today you know, are not important in terms of divisions, but, but some of the divisions that have happened you know, in our relative recently past you know, are extraordinarily divisive, you know, and we should sometimes get some of our divisions into perspective. What about people who've got a home and people who haven't got a home? There's 17,000 on Southwark's council house waiting list at the moment. That seems to be a big problem. Uh, if they built 17,000 uh, next week in a magic, magic moment, uh, how long would it take for another 17,000 to go on the waiting list is a interesting question. Um, I would think it wouldn't be wouldn't be that long. Just the pressure of coming into London, coming into this economically active place. What about young versus old, and those with pensions and those without pensions? Trump supporters yeah. and not Trump supporters. So, what about development, and how does this um, affect what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do? Uh, what Southwark's trying to do. Um, almost everyone thinks we need more, more homes. Almost everyone thinks we need more gainful employment. Uh, and almost everyone wants the environment around them and uh, in the whole of the country to be better. Uh, but actually deciding where to put the new homes and where to put the business uh, at that local level is always much more challenging. And then even if the policy context at a local level says this is what you should do, there are always a number of different ways uh, that you could deliver a particular design. Uh, and it's not just development that has these issues. Uh, in World War II you had the Mosquito fighter bomber, you had the B-17, two planes that actually became very good bombers, but very, very different approaches from the Americans and the British to, to deal with a particular challenge. You could have Bloomsbury as a relatively high density development, or we could have parts of Caracas or Mumbai or places like that. You know, very different ways of dealing with particular designs. Paris has got twice the density of population than London. Uh, I don't think many people would actually realise that if you go through Paris. Barcelona has got four times the density. Uh, of London in terms of the built area. So, so what is it about London that you know, we think it's too crowded, there's too much development? Um, it's just the way we do it, maybe. Maybe it's the locations uh, we put developments in, force developments to go in places that maybe aren't ideal. 
Um, I was asked to, um, to try and respond to changing ways we live and work. And just looking back on some of the places that you might think are your uh, favourite urban developments, towns, cities, you know, they were probably all located there. Uh, because they were locations of economic activity. Um, they were places where transportation you know, could deliver the trading and the economic activity, the ports, the valleys, the intersections of coaching routes. And it was the Industrial Revolution, the railways, that really made the next big difference, the first big difference, to the way that we started to develop uh, in Britain and throughout the world. Uh, not necessarily just you know, the death of distance from, from railways, but commuter towns and, and the way industry started to, to move around the raw materials of those <coughs> industrial revolution activities um, caused a huge change in the way that we have developed on our, um, on our land. And just, to, just to dispel a bit of a myth about overdevelopment, you know, I've already mentioned the Barcelona and the, and the Paris density. Um, although 96% of the UK is developed, a lot of that development, the vast majority of that development, that 94% of that development is not actually built on with concrete or buildings. It's forestry, it's intensive farming. The land has been managed, it has been developed for, for other activities. So is there going to be another major disruptive force on the way we live and work? Uh, instead of James Watt and Stevenson, um, what, what's the next big way forward? Well, obviously, in the, in the 20th century, it was the motor car. So you had Henry Ford and Rockefeller, you know, <coughs> internal combustion engine and petrol. Uh, and that changed the way that we built um, more than anything else, because obviously with the growing populations, uh, the cars and the use of cars uh, has affected most of, most of our environment in a dramatic way. So Larry Page, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, you know, these are the big disruptors, autonomous vehicles. Um, I don't think, I don't think they are going to have that much of an effect on our urban um, <coughs> planning. Um, there's a very interesting uh, picture of it. I won't try and show you, but it's autonomous vehicles all kind of convoying and getting very close. You know, and they say, oh, yeah, they'll be able to almost join up. They could almost join up and then you can have interconnecting doors and you could actually stand up and you could socially interact with the people in the other vehicle. It's called a train. So I think you know we are in danger of reinventing for urban transport anyway, uh, trains and trams uh, and public transport. I do believe is the way for higher density cities, and that will carry on in the future. I'm not dismissing autonomous vehicles and that technology. I think they have a huge role uh, in many parts of our lives. So we have choices um, as to how we develop. I'm not saying that uh, you know, our cities will end up looking like Hong Kong, but clearly um, we can deliver higher densities um, as is demonstrated by the rest of the world, maybe. Now, in Birmingham, how did we build a consensus? Well, in 1988, uh, in Birmingham, uh, there was something called the Hybrid Initiative, and if any of you are interested in, in building a strong consensus with a, with a pretty diverse group of people from uh, all sorts of communities up there, uh, they wrote this vision document to, to try and do something about, fundamentally, the, the hemorrhaging of jobs from Birmingham and, the, and the, um, the high unemployment as the industrial base of our country was reducing very fast. Uh, and this Highbury initiative set out a plan for, for the whole of the city. And that very strong vision then enabled much more local policies to come in and get supported. And Brindley Place in Birmingham was uh, a result uh, of one of the more local policies that came out of that, of that very strong uh, initiative. Uh, what Birmingham did was they reduced the reliance on private cars in the city. Uh, they connected the city with pedestrian routes from, from one side to the other. They encouraged walking. Um, and <coughs> that journeying, people walking through the city, uh, became something that um, hadn't happened for quite a while up there. Uh, what did I learn? What did we learn from uh, from Brindley Place? Uh, we learnt that. All right, just check the time there. We learnt that uh, new streets and new squares, a flexible framework that allowed development to come and go uh, as the market allowed, 
uh, was the way to not go bust uh, and to eventually deliver something that I think most people are proud of. Uh, we tried different uses in buildings. I know it's hard to, to believe, uh, but we put restaurants under office buildings. Uh, we put residential uh, in the heart of the city centre. In the early 90s, that wasn't happening, um, certainly in our, in our provincial cities. Uh, and in Manchester, uh, it was the bomb, the IRA bomb in 1996, that built a very strong consensus and a very clear plan for the city that we then responded. Now, King's Cross, uh, which my company then was very lucky to be selected for as a developer uh, in 2000, had had uh, quite a challenging history, certainly, uh, from the planning and, and the politics point of view. Um, and I was told about the, the 1970s rent riots and the, and the us and them uh, that was very strong uh, in the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, and I was told that uh, all private land ownership was seen as theft by some, some people. And if you had a job, you're almost a class enemy. So some of that is almost coming back now. I wore a suit for the first time with my sons going to uh, an old aunt's wedding the other, the other week. Uh, and someone walked down the street looking at the three of us and called us. I won't say the first word, but it began with F, and the other two words were Tory scum. Now, you know, my kids looked at me and they said, why did he say that, Dad? And I gave them a little explanation. They said, shall we have him? <laughs> and I said, no, don't. But, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's a bit aggressive what's going on at the moment. Um, I won't go on about uh, King's Cross because uh, you guys can all go up and see it. But uh, other than to say that there was a very strong vision that was endorsed by, uh, certainly by the local authorities, certainly by English Heritage, uh, and a lot of the people that we saw, I saw 7,200, I know that because you know, we listed them all out, uh, and the vast majority of those uh, were very supportive. But there was a very strong uh, group of opponents who, um, who did challenge the development all the way through uh, and after the, the planning process. And all I can say to them is thanks very much because actually it stopped us borrowing lots of money just before the financial crisis. It pushed us to start the development at the end of 2008. So I'm not saying we would have gone bust, but it would have been, it would have been very difficult um, if we had started in 2007. So sometimes you get, you get lucky for strange reasons. Uh, but certainly as King's Cross has gone through the planning system... OK, um, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, as it's gone through the planning system, every application for approval of reserve matters for the 60-odd buildings there has gone through unanimously uh, in favour by the politicians. It wasn't like that at the beginning. I think once we'd built a trust and they'd seen the quality, um, you know, they were much more prepared to embrace it uh, and, and get involved you know, in, a, in a constructive way. So at Canada Water, we have an amazing opportunity. It is the similar size and scale to King's Cross, but very different. It's a very different part of town. Um, and the policy saying create a, a new town centre, a new urban environment. Um, I don't think, and if anyone here can, can tell me later, I don't think anyone's actually created a new town centre you know, within Greater London for over 150 years. You know, most of the towns that we know, the Chiswick's, you know, the Islington's, and the Marrowbones, the, the Brixton's, they were all kind of embryonic. They were there on the, on the coaching routes out. So, so to build a new town centre, uh, you know, with all of the things that you'd expect in a town centre, from the public uses, the social uses, the public spaces, the shops, and places to work, is, is a huge opportunity and, and a huge privilege. Someone said to me, um, very kindly, uh, you have a lot of patience, uh, you seem to have uh, a lot of passion, um, but you seem to have a purpose, and I think they very generous. It wasn't my wife, actually, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but patience, passion, and purpose, I think, are the three things you know, any developer uh, should have, uh, and anyone that wants to, to work alongside uh, the process should have as well. The themes at, uh, at Canada Water here, uh, and there are themes, children and the elderly, making this new place, this new city centre, town centre, urban centre, whatever you want to call it. A place where you can just, as they say in Italy, faraione passeggiata, you can just go for a walk, you can just wander. And some of the most successful urban places, I think, is where you feel very comfortable just wandering and discovering and exploring. And if we can make 
the spaces and the routes and the pavements, you know, very friendly to children and the elderly. Uh, I think we will have made a very, a very good start. And of course, it's not just the 53 acres we've got at Carinder Water. It's 120 amazing acres of park and woodland and, and dock, and then the amazing rest of the 400 and odd acres of, of Rotherhithe, uh, and then across the park into South Bermondsey. That is just an extraordinary, uh, amazing part of London. Uh, everyone that comes to us is worried about social connections, um, mental health. Is, is a huge issue as well as physical health and uh, businesses. This is businesses are talking about mental health and well-being more than I've ever known, and, and quite rightly. Uh, and what we're going to try and do at Canada, what we are going to do at Canada, also if if, uh, if we can move forward, is on a Wednesday afternoon uh, we're going to ring a bell, a metaphorical bell maybe, but we're going to try and connect. We're going to give people opportunities to connect. So whether that's businesses they want to volunteer to work in schools, they want to come and work in the old people's homes or work with some of the great charities around here, work with Jane's Charity or work with Time and Talent or some of the others, uh, or just set up a time bank so people can help and meet and socially connect. And I think getting those, those connections and helping those connections, because it's very difficult. You, know, you have to go through quite big checks, just, you can't just turn up in the school and say I want to do a reading class, you can't just say I want to play five-a-side football here and you've only got four people and stuff like that. So, so we can do that because we will be managing the 53 uh, odd acres um, and I think that's one of the most exciting things uh, about Canada Water. Uh, and we're not, we're not making a new place, you know, there is a place there, get 7.2 million customer visits, there's a place all the way around, we're, we're evolving the place in quite a a dramatic way, some people would say, but um, I think the lessons that I've learned over the last 30 years uh, will never be more uh, important as we move forward in this, in this, what feels like an ever increasingly divided society and community, but I actually think there are stronger bonds between all of us than, than ever, certainly in, in the history that I've read and look back and I am very optimistic, um, not quite as optimistic maybe as Stephen Pinker uh, in, his, in his book, um, The Age of Enlightenment, which is, which is a good read if you're feeling pessimistic about things. Um, and I will, I will finish just by saying uh, something strange. I hate three things. I actually hate the word hate, but yeah, I hate three things. Uh, I hate insincerity uh, from anyone. Uh, I hate the misuse of information. Uh, and what we've tried to do at Canada Water is to inform people the best we can with our context for development. If any of you want to see it, it's on, on the website, and we did that at King's Cross as well. And I really hate mediocrity because you know, we've all got one life, uh, and to kind of wake up in the morning and think, I'm just going to do something really average, uh, is not a very good thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and everyone I know in, in a professional capacity or, or even not in a professional capacity they do get up in the morning and they do want to be able to utilise their skills in the best way possible to get things done. Uh, and my job is basically just to choreograph and bring those amazing people together uh, and try and do something that isn't mediocre at all. And keep the dialogue open because I love the dialogue. You know, we have never got all the right answers for anything. We haven't even got all the questions. Um, and it's that strength of dialogue from, from Southwark and the planners and from the GLA and Transport for London, but from all of you and all of the people that might want to come to Canada Water in the future or might be on the other side of, of London or the other side of the UK, you know, they can help in a constructive way and I want to keep that dialogue open. So thank you very much.